So, all right, we are going to look at several items from our bank that test different steps in this clinical judgment process. Uh, you're typically going to see these on the NCLEX in the form of case studies, but just for the sake of time today, we're going to look at a couple of these uh, in the form of standalone items. So, Next gen case studies are typically where you're gonna find your clinical judgment items and we're gonna look at some standalones. So the first question in a case study is gonna ask you your ability to recognize cues and that's to figure out what's most important. Because you guys know that as a nurse, you always have like 10 things going on at one time, right? Your patient has five things in their medical history, they have four medications due and they're on their call light and the person next door is getting out of bed. And so it's really important that as a nurse, you can figure out what in the moment is most important. So we're gonna pick from which of these assessment findings are most important. So here we've got a client with severe COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Which of these findings is gonna require immediate follow-up? And so remember on the NCLEX, if you are asked to select what requires immediate follow-up, you are looking for an unexpected abnormal that you need to do something about, right? So we're gonna have all kinds of abnormal findings that are expected. And so we wanna make sure that we're prioritizing those unexpected abnormals. All right, and so what do you guys think? And we're gonna do a quick review while you guys think about it on what COPD is. So in COPD, you can have either chronic bronchitis or um, emphysema or both. And so in chronic bronchitis, you have chronic damage from an irritant. And I bet you guys can remember what the number one irritant is that causes COPD. So what's that type in it in the comment box? But in chronic bronchitis, that irritant damages and inflames the bronchioles and that causes this inflammation and narrowing of the airway. So you can't get air in. And then in chronic emphysema, you've got destruction to the alveoli. So instead of this alveoli being like a really nice stretchy balloon right out of the package where it deflates and all the air exits smoothly, instead it's become like a floppy plastic grocery bag. And so when the client exhales, this just kind of collapses in on itself and that is going to prevent the air from getting out here. All right, so knowing this, which of these findings would require immediate follow-up? How about one, lower extremity edema? So why would somebody with COPD have lower extremity edema? What complication of COPD would cause that? All right, why would somebody have edema? So do you guys remember what, okay, good. Florabelle's got it, heart failure, yes. So, and yes, you guys even got it as right-sided heart failure. Really well done, Marissa. So in COPD, this chronic kind of high pressure system in the lungs can put strain on the heart. And so yes, that can cause some right-sided heart failure. Now, does that require immediate follow-up? It might, right? Heart failure might. So if I had signs of pulmonary edema, like pink frothy sputum or restlessness, that would require immediate follow-up. But what would you even do about the lower extremity edema? You would probably just prop their feet up, right? So this isn't something that I need to immediately follow up on. So it's not this one. We'll just keep an eye on it, prop their vita. All right, paradoxical respirations. Several of you guys liked this. And I mean, liked it as the correct answer, not liked it in your patient. But yes, paradoxical respirations is never normal. So this is not an expected abnormal finding. This is something I'd like to keep an eye on. Um, so in paradoxical respirations, instead of the normal rise and fall of the chest when you breathe in and out, it's inverse because your patient is sucking in the breath and having to work hard to push it out. And so this is an indicator of a really, really high work of breathing and this patient is getting tired. And so I immediately want to follow up on this, I'm pretty sure, but let's look at our other options just to be safe. So an increased hemoglobin level, is that expected or unexpected in COPD? What do you guys think? So why would somebody with COPD have an increased hemoglobin level? And that is because of something called polycythemia vera, right? These clients have chronic hypoxemia. They chronically have a low blood oxygen. And so in an attempt to kind of compensate for this, your body starts to produce more and more red blood cells in order to try and carry more oxygen around through the body. And so that is gonna create an elevated hemoglobin. Good, everybody's saying this is expected, right? So I would just monitor this. There's nothing I wanna do about this right now. All right, then in a pulse oximetry reading, 88%. Do you guys remember what the normal pulse oximetry reading is for COPD? Yes, 
good job, everybody. <laughs> you said, no, no, you don't remember. All right, so the normal pulse oximetry range for COPD is 88 to 92%. So there's nothing I would need to do about a pulse oximetry. Yes, Florabelle's got it. There's nothing I would need to do about this. I would only need to increase their oxygen if their pulse ox was 87% or lower. So out of all of these, the only one that requires immediate follow-up is this paradoxical respirations. And remember this key term for the NCLEX, you guys, because this is never normal. They might give you this finding in a patient with asthma. They might give you this finding in a patient um, with rib fractures, right, and a chest wall trauma, but it is never normal. It's always gonna be a warning sign of impending respiratory failure. So very well done, you guys. And yes, you can see in our question bank that only 57% of our users answered this correctly. So if you guys got this one right, you are already ahead of the curve and well done.